thank you very much, AI, to advise us that it is recorded. Um, I am very glad and happy to welcome here Daniel Mate with us today. Those who don't know him, he's a compositor, he's a lyricist, he has a podcast, he's a musician and a mental chiropractor. And on that note, you might recognize his surname, which is Mate, which also means that he's a son of Dr. Mate Gabor or Gabor Mate, as he's known in the English speaking world. I'm Hungarian, as you might realize. And uh, in Hungary, we say Mate Gabor and Mate Daniel. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time for being us with here today. Well, thank you, uh, Solium uh, Anna. <laughs> yes, Shoyum. Shoyum, yeah. okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I was I was very curious to be able to talk to you because uh, um, it's not always easy to be the son or the daughter of someone, especially if it's someone who is getting very well known in the world. Yeah. And I wonder, how does it feel for you presently? What is going on? with your father, with his work in trauma and addictions and so on. What, you know, what's interesting is it's it's never been easier for me to be his son. I'm less concerned with what he's doing. I'm much more interested in what I'm doing okay. uh, than I ever have before. And it's weird. I, I would have thought it would be the opposite because now I'm getting to be known by people. I wasn't on podcasts before. People didn't, you know, it's by virtue of the fact that I wrote a book with him. And I'm not going to kid myself into thinking that he, you know, He's not the major reason because uh, he's already put in his work and time to become as well known as he is. But yeah. somehow doing this book with him, writing it with him, making it possible for him to write it, it wasn't going to happen without me. You know, he really needed that help. And I'm proud of the work I did. I'm proud of our collaboration. And by collaborating, I got to see the differences between us. I'm like, oh, wow, here's what I'm good at. Here's what he's good at. Here's where my skills support and lift up his work um and then with the book coming out we've done a bit of touring to, like we've done a few events together and i think if i was doing that all the time i'd be very tired yeah. of being around him professionally because you know once i've heard him answer the same questions the same way five times i don't need to hear it another 50. yeah uh, i i imagine and it can be a little too close for comfort you know because especially i get into it yeah, i've been to conferences with him where I'm sitting on the stage and he's sitting on the stage and the line to talk to him is like around it's out the door and you know a few people are hanging out to talk to me so that could get a little tiring for the ego but the fact is most of the stuff i'm doing i'm doing on my own you know he's not here on this podcast absolutely been, not I've, you I've are been, here yeah so far i've been to miami and chicago by myself to talk about the book i'm going to serbia and hungary next week by myself um, so I'm starting to get invited on my own steam and people are telling me they're hearing my podcast appearances and they like how I put things and not that the, all the praise and validation is what matters, but it's a nice reflection for me that actually I'm different and it's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. He can be him. I wouldn't want the amount of acclaim and attention he has. Can you imagine having that many people looking at you as a guru? Yeah, that's uh, super it, tiring. It, it would drive me freaking yeah. crazy. And also like the the gap between how people see me and who I am in private to myself, like I don't know how he does it, but he's gotten used to it and he's earned it and God bless him. He's almost 80 years old. He deserves it. Yeah, I, I love I, you here to saying that you, you are your own self and you like that. That's but what I've been learning. And and then when we do work together, we you know, we lead our workshop called Hello Again, a yeah. fresh start for parents and their adult children. We just did it in Vancouver two weeks ago. And I really felt comfortable on stage with him. And I really felt like he was respecting me and giving my space. So somehow it's almost homeopathic. Working closely with him has given me a much stronger sense of, of healthy, not even boundaries, but just definition. I know where he ends and I begin, which has always been my lifelong problem. I said to him when I was nine years old, I don't know where you end and I begin. I used those yeah, words. I I remember that because you say it in the first uh, Hello Again workshop that was recorded, I think in 2016, you also gave right. this example. Yeah. And um, I wonder who did the first step in that reconciliation with him? Well, you know, I'm, I'm just pausing because of the word reconciliation. 
it Maybe sounds that... it sounds very touchy feely. Okay. You know, it's it sounds like let's reconcile, let's make nice, let's make peace, all of that. Oh. And yes, ultimately that's a piece of it, right? But I think actually when you reconcile your books, you balance your checkbook. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, and what would be the ac- words that you would no, it's a great it's a great word. Uh rapprochement, reconciliation, but also just completion. Completion. I, yeah. And I've and I let's put it this way. He's always wanted it with his children. Yeah. But the fact is that it's always been more urgent for me. Because at a certain point, his job as a parent is done and he doesn't need to sort out his relationship. With, he's done what he's done. He's hyper aware of the impact of parenting on kids. No more. No one in the world is more aware than him, which doesn't, isn't always healthy because it yeah. can become overly self-conscious. And yeah, it might not help, actually. It might not help. help. No, no, no. Because then your, ch- your parents always looking at you through the filter of, oh, geez, I fucked that up. <laughs> Oh, there's that wound I left. You know, it's not fun. Yeah. You know, being seen. You know, you're, you're still not being seen for who you are. Yeah. It's just now. Yeah. It's through. Now it's through this. This. It's a know, different filter. Different approach. It's a, it's a new different yeah. filter, but it's still a filter. However, for me as the adult kid, with struggling as an adult with my own struggles, and wanting to become myself and trying to figure out who the hell that is trying to come out from underneath the shadow of of my dad and my parents, both the public shadow, but also the psychological mm-hmm. shadows. It's always been of more urgency for me to get clear on what's happening between us and what happened. See, in my case, most, most people have the problem with their parents that their parents will never want to have a conversation about the past because they yeah. feel too guilty or they're in denial or they just don't have the psychological bandwidth. Yeah, you In know, my you- case... In my Um, case, my parents have been telling me about how they treated me as a little kid since I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. I've been hyper conscious of it. So I've had their version of my childhood in my head as knowledge, but that doesn't mean direct experience. It's like a different kind of superego. You could think of it as like an enlightened, (laughs) psychobabbling superego, but now I have all the explanations. So why haven't I, why am I still messed up? Yeah, yeah. What, so I what, what, what the gap was, and this was really until my 30s, my late 30s, realizing, no, wait a minute. I haven't gotten to speak my own truth here. So the idea for the Hello Again workshop was mine, and I'm the one who's kind of driven it a lot. Um, we're going to be writing the book on that soon, and I expect yeah. to be sort of the primary author in terms of writing the stuff first, and then we'll collaborate the way we did on Method Normal. Um yeah, it's been a matter of more urgency for me. And as we've gone along, we've both seen, felt more and more hopeful about it. And so we both then engage in it in more and more good faith. Because if there's prospects or possibilities of something fresh, which is what we offer. I mean, we call it a fresh start for parents yeah. and their adult children, not a happy ending for parents no, and their adult children. Absolutely. It's a fresh start, whatever that looks like, something new, just something fresh, something not programmed. Um, I, I I I love that, and uh, I had the chance to be in his book, one of the book presentations in Hungary, and he said, "You actually teamed up for two books, and the book on uh, adult parents. I mean, they are adult, adult children and parents is yeah. on the way. You will be doing that, where you will have a lot more space to tell how you think and feel about all this. And oh, I you bet. It. I love it because." Um, just to add one personal note that my parents are divorced and I'm one of those lucky human beings whose parents actually stayed uh, friends. And I still remember that I was 18 when I realized that, oh my God, it's been years that I miss my father. Mm. That sucks. Mm. So I did initiate these talks and we did our own process. And uh, recently a client of mine told me that, well, you're lucky. My parents doesn't want to hear me. And I said, wow. Okay, so it really does make the difference what you say that actually there is an openness to be this fresh start. Not it's not about reconciliation. Maybe maybe it is. Maybe it's not about who is the victim and who is no. the one to blame because it's about two human beings who really would like to re-establish the relationship or freshly restart seeing freshly, each freshly other. establish it. Yeah see the past clearly enough for it to disappear for, as a concern enough yes. for the programming of it to, for us to stop reliving it um you know and it's not even we're reconciling with each other we're reconciling ourselves to how it's been 
And then we're asking ourselves, okay, well, who are we now? And what do we want? What do we want to create? Now, here's the thing. It doesn't have to be mutual. People come to our workshops who don't have a willing partner in their adult child or in their parent. Maybe the adult child is addicted and beyond the possibility of starting anything fresh. Maybe the adult parent is demented or dead or in a cult. Um, Then people need to grieve and come to terms with how things are. But even then, there's the chance of a fresh start in terms of my relationship to the relationship, which is going to affect every other part of my life. Since we're always reliving our childhoods, the way I look at my childhood, the way I look at my parents, even if I decide never to speak to them again, which is a perfectly legitimate choice. There's no shoulds here. One of the things that makes the adult parent-child relationship so intensely unique is that it started out as the most mandatory relationship in the world, and it ends up as the most optional relationship in the world. You do not need each other anymore, and neither of you is responsible for the other anymore. Exactly. And for a lot of parents... How do you make that transition? And so there is a, a valid choice to be made. You know what? I can't have this. I don't want this person in my life. But even then, they're still going to be there in your inner life. Yeah, like a super eager or just realizing that, oh, shit, I'm doing this thing as my mother or my father right. because and they then, share us. Exactly. And then am I going to resent and blame my mother or am I going to understand that she passed on to me what she couldn't help passing on to me? Um, am I going to blame myself or am I going to realize, you know what, it's legitimate for me to have anger about this and I'm clearly not through with my anger one of the things that people say to me sometimes when they come to the workshop they say i need to forgive my mother i say no you don't yeah you do not need to forgive your mother and in fact needing to is never going to have you do it it's not an act of will as shakespeare said the quality of mercy is not strained it doesn't respond to effort it droppeth like it droppeth like the gentle rain from heaven it's grace it happens when it's it's ready Yes, you exactly. Can set the conditions, but some of the conditions are you got to feel what is there to feel. And if you hate them, you got to take some time to fucking hate them for a while, or at least yeah. to feel that the hatred is there. Maybe not to act on the hatred, but to acknowledge and honor all the parts of you that have very spontaneously and naturally and authentically responded to what you encountered when you came into this world, expecting one thing and getting a whole other thing. Yes. And that is sometimes very difficult because we need to take off all these layers uh you know cultural layers religious layers whatever layer we have and just allow the feeling to be present without acting upon that that requires a lot of lot of braveness like courage and uh and space yeah it might it might require courage i wonder though about courage as i think (laughs) i think it requires crystal clarity yeah, but you really it. need to want the truth. I mean, you, you, well, you have to get real. you have to want it, but how are you going to want it? How, you can't make yourself want it. You can't make yourself be courageous. It has to be worth it to you. Yeah, that's it has to seem like the best option, which means you have to clearly see how much suffering is caused by not doing that. And you have to get fucking sick and t- sorry for all the cursing, but you okay. have to get sick and tired of it. Yeah. And you have to say, well, whatever the other option is, even if it's the unknown, even if I'm scared. I'm willing, the courage for the sake of courage is meaningless. You know, we admire courageous people, not just because they did something that to other people would be crazily dangerous, but because they did it for something. Exactly. For for a reason that really mattered to them. And in the, and because of that reason, that got over them the hump, that got them over the hump of fear. So yeah, it's courageous, but it's also, I mean, what it is, is heroic. Because yeah. you're stepping into some unknown for a bigger purpose. But when you're in that space, when you're when you are the hero. It doesn't feel like being the hero. It feels the no, most you just gotta thing. you just gotta yeah. do it. It's your exactly. destiny. There's exactly. your fate, what you were born with, and then there's what's pulling you forward, your destination, your destiny. So yeah, I tr- I try not to tell people you have to be courageous or you have to be vulnerable. I d- I have to tell them you just have to really be in, you just have to really want it. So yeah. the question is. If you're not sure if you want it, well, let's take a look at how it is now and take a real inventory of <laughs> what it what it gets you and what it costs you. And then you can choose. Exactly. Choice is important. Now that takes courage. It takes courage to ask those questions for sure, because you might not like the answers. Hmm. And how and was they it? Re- and they might require you to get out of your comfort zone. Because yeah. when we're stuck, when we're resentful, when we're 
victimized, whatever, there's always a payoff. There's a part of us that would be perfectly happy staying there. So in 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 your own life, this uh questions showed up in a way that you said, I know why I want it. I will go out of my comfort zone because I want it to function. I want to know who I am. I want to know who my father is. Because I'm unwilling to re-experience this reenacted scene over and uh, one more time. I've done it enough. Yeah. I've done my time. That's it. There's nothing more to learn from experiencing this nightmare again. Yeah. And you use the word I'm nightmare. Ready to, I'm ready to wake up from the nightmare. Yeah. No matter tough. what, no matter what the other maybe, maybe it's out of the frying pan into the fire. But I yeah. want to find out. It's yeah. like, you know what it is? It's like Neo in the Matrix. Absolutely. He's living, he's living in a comfortable, simulated reality where he has all of his physical survival needs met. He has a job. It's boring. It's unfulfilling, but at least it distracts him. He's yeah. got material pleasures. He's got women. He's got all the things that is the hedonistic things he wants. But something feels off. And then he starts seeing glitches in that matrix. He starts noticing things. And the minute he starts noticing things, the matrix starts to swoop in to try and stop him from noticing more. But that only arouses his curiosity. The one choice he makes is to take the one pill over the other pill. And then he has to deal with the consequences of having chosen that pill, which is to have a lot of comfortable coping mechanisms and comfortable illusions stripped away from you. But what are the advantages? All of a sudden, he's more powerful than he realized. There's genuine connection. There's a sense of purpose. He knows kung fu, and yes. he can and he can dodge bullets <laughs> and bend spoons. Yeah. And he's and he's the one that he's been waiting for. So that's the that's the choice. And we, it all comes to us at different times in different intensities. But yeah, yeah, I I, I use a lot this uh, this metaphor from from the Matrix when Neo wants to well the first time that Morpheus takes him to the jumping you know from the buildings and then he says okay I just need to free my mind come on mind free yourself and of course he falls and I'm like come on you, you, this is the grace I mean you can't make your mind get free you can't make yourself to forgive you can't make yourself being something as you are That's that right. is the process this is how we all get there at the end. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't have to you can't free your mind, you can mind your freedom. You know, you can you can become aware. You have to yeah. become aware of where you haven't been free. Exactly. And and realize all the places that you actually are that you didn't realize were just mindsets, just states of mind and you have to go through the veil of illusion and you really have to I mean at least in my case I've had to suffer in order to get to those places. There's no way around it. No, because I, but, I only but, learn through experience. I might, you could, I could read all the Eckhart Tolle in the world. I think we all learn through experiences. Whoever says that, no, that's not true. And and pain and suffering is an important master. I mean, I think that if it is not painful enough, we're not going to move our ass. Just very simple. I, look, I think that's right. And and my dad, I think, is an instructive example. He's put his stuff out there into the world. I was just uh, recording the audio book of his very first book, Scattered Minds, about attention yeah. deficit disorder, which is being republished in the United States. So they wanted a new audio book version. So I just finished it in the studio yesterday here in Brooklyn. And I'm reading through it. This book was written in 1999, or at least that's when it came out. And he's writing about his difficulties with my mom and their relationship. And he writes, fortunately, we have put that behind us. We have healed it. We have brought our ship safely into the same harbor. And I'm thinking, yeah, mm -hmm. three three years later, you almost left her. Wow. He writes about his he writes about his compact disc addiction, about in my compact disc buying days, well, 10 years later, he wrote another book about how it was still going on. Yeah. Yeah, we so have our issues. Even, even speaking about it publicly, even admitting it, even knowing all about it doesn't change anything we have to suffer enough that something up uh, up on us wakes up says shit i have something to lose yeah and i don't want to lose it and you have to get scared of because the thing is it's not that we act from fear but we have to act from an awareness an appropriately reverent relationship with our own death because we yes. are going to die true and it's not something to be afraid of but it is a God that we'd better respect because it is going to have its way, but only a hundred percent of the time. We, there is no getting out of that one, meaning yeah. that we have some responsible choices to make. And when we're addicted or when we're in patterns, we act as if we have all the time in the world. Yeah, we do. We do, but we don't. Okay. There was never anyone who did get their no way one. out of this. <laughs> no one. 
Say. No one. Buddha, not Buddha, not Jesus, Nay. not Nay. not John Lennon, nobody. Yeah. Can I ask you something around uh, your roots, family roots? Sure. Do you know Hungarian? I don't. I'm going to find out how much I don't know it when I go next week. No, I, I barely know a single word. I can say servus. servus. That's about it. Servus. That's very yeah, good. I can, That's... Yeah, I can say that. Yeah. And, and uh, you... I grew up hearing it. So the, the rhythm of it, the music of it, I, I can get. Um, I'm sure I'll learn some in the three or four days that I'm there. Yeah. But I've never been, I've never been, I haven't been very connected to my Hungarian roots. It's been sort of a, a legend to me. Okay. But I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to Hungary. I'm going to visit the place where my dad was born and look at where he almost died and, yeah. um, yeah. and take in some culture and. And this is your first trip to Hungary. First trip to Hungary. Okay. Are you excited? I am excited. I mean, it's part of, so I'm flying to Serbia. I'm speaking at a conference in Serbia of all places And then I'm excited for that. And then I'm going to rent a car in Belgrade Airport, drive to Budapest, and then, continue, and then continue on a month-long solo road trip through Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Slovenia, and Croatia. Wow. Wonderful. I see amazing. a lot of places I've never been. Good. Spend That's... Christmas Christmas in Munich, New Year's in Florence. It's going to be wow. really exciting. Yeah, That's... I can't wait. I can't <laughs> yeah. wait. So you squeeze a little bit of holiday in it for you to explore and get. Oh yeah, no, I'm making it. I'm making it as much holiday as I can. Yeah, mm, I'm happy for. I'll, I'll give some. I'll do some events in 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 Serbia and in in Hungary. But after that, after that, you're just, all it's just for me. Yeah, and are you looking forward to to work in this book with your father, the new one, the Hello Again? I am looking forward to it. I'm a little I'm a little wary of it taking up too much of my time. I have so many other things going on. I'm a I write musicals, as you said, and I have a musical that's being performed in Philadelphia in April and rehearsals will be starting wow. in February every weekend. I'll be driving down every weekend to to do rehearsals in Philadelphia. Um and I've got a lot of work to do on that because I'm translating the I'm I'm orchestrating the piano score for a string quartet which is a wow. whole learning curve for me because I've never yeah. written for strings. Um, plus, I'm starting a new podcast uh, about lyrics with my friend Carice Van Houten, who is an actress who was on Game of Thrones. Okay. People might know her from that show. Yeah. Um, and, and we're doing a show called Let's Get Lyrical, which will be launching in the new year. Oh, I'm so loving that'll be, And again, so both of those things, musical theater and a lyrics-oriented podcast – Neither of those things have anything directly to do with healing, trauma, the mind, self-help, any of that. And I love that. I need that because yeah. that's my dad's world. And if I'm only in that world and if I'm only collaborating with him, I'm losing a big part of myself. But at the same time, I don't need to avoid it entirely or boycott it or strike from it in order to be myself because that's also a part of me. And I do this yeah. mental chiropractic thing with people still, which is my own version of therapy but it's not therapy at all i'm not I, i don't have if i see somebody i'm trying to see them as if we're only seeing each other once they can always come back but i want it to be i want the person to come in with it with the attitude of okay what do i want to shift what do i want to get unstuck about okay i've got an hour and 15 minutes with daniel let's do yeah. it yeah so you you're giving an impulse basically or you're offering yeah. an impulse where it is most needed an impulse an impetus uh, a boost a kick in the ass you know fire <laughs> yeah, the butt that could be useful sometimes. whatever absolutely because i won't work with somebody if they don't have a strong intention i'm not going to take a walk with because this is i do it while walking with people uh -huh. on the phone on the phone or in person but mostly on the phone because my clients are all over the world I, i'm not going to spend my time walking with someone who just wants to speculate or be cerebral about it no, like, no you've got to be sick boring. of this if you're, because you know what and it's really really just selfish for me also it's for them But really, there's no separation. If they're sick enough of it, they are going to allow me to talk straight to them. Yes. And I don't want to pussyfoot around. I don't want to have to be nice about it. Yeah, well, you're the one is... who you're the one who's stuck. You're the one who's sick of it. Okay. Yeah. So you let's talk. Hear something? You want to hear something? Let's talk. You know, I don't have my dad's patience of hmm, when did you first feel that way? <laughs> Compassion and inquiry yeah. and you know, this and that. Like It's a very patient guy, and, and which people absolutely need. And I'm in therapy myself. I've got nothing against it, but it's not what I do best. And I only want to do what I do best because what else am I on the planet for? You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And what 
act. So you talked about a little bit of music. How is it a different universe from your dad's, but still it connects and how you need both. So what is music in your life? What did it give you? Well, the funny, one of the, one of the funny, sad things is that I had to find my way out from underneath my dad's obsession with music as he's written about. He's the world's oh, yeah. most the, compact yeah. disc addict, you know, yeah. uh, classical music blaring constantly in our house, some of which I liked, some of which, including the Bartok, I found a little grating. Now I like Bartok, but yeah, Bartok. but I, but I, but I had emotional associations with it. The music was where my, my dad would go to hide out from the rest of us. He'd be in the living room by himself, blasting his records instead of playing with me or, and, hmm. and it was a play, you know, hmm. so I, there was something and I, I played piano and I took classical piano lessons from an, a, a very stern, but nice Russian couple. And I wanted to write pop and jazz, but that wasn't as valued. So mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. my own way to a musical expression that really feels like mine has been a lifelong journey. And I think when I got into musical theater, that was a big step because now I can bring together all the genres I like and tell stories, tell characters, depict human beings, use music to, to represent real life um, and not just try to write background music or pop songs. Yeah. And, and you like that. I see oh, I like it. Oh, lighting no, I up, it. explaining that, that you can write no, I love it. people and I, stories. So it's like storytelling it. with music. Storytelling with music and... And also just bringing together all these different sounds. I mean, I grew up, I wasn't even a musical theater fan. Uh, I was a Metallica fan. I was a Soundgarden fan. I was a Beastie Boys fan. And then later I was a, you know, Wu-Tang Clan and Biggie Smalls and Tupac and Radiohead and Bjork and Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and, St and then Stephen Sondheim, you know, musical theater. Yeah. And what I loved about each of them is that they all created a world with their music and their lyrics. And... There's, there's drama in it. There's theater in it. So when I write a musical, I'm drawing on everything I've ever heard. And and one of the things that I like about it that really separates it from my work with my dad is that it comes from a place in me that doesn't have any words. Oh. It comes from that pre-verbal place that's not... That's wonderful. It's 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 intelligent, but it's not smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, there is a rawness in this space, uh, as What's I understand. That? A raw. It's, it's kind of raw. It's raw. It's raw, it's yeah, raw. absolutely, and it's but just there is there this force of creation that's just like yeah. bam, exactly, and no one can agree with it or disagree with it. It just is, and if it connects with other people, great, but it has to come out of me. So, the only thing I'm feeling ambivalent about in terms of going into writing another book with my father is: can I trust myself to maintain my fence around that part of my life enough that it doesn't get swallowed up by? It's undoubtedly exciting to be writing a book about my relationship with my father, putting it out there. Obviously, there's financial rewards for being of course, published. You know, you, when you write yeah. a musical, there's no guarantee that it'll ever get out there. With these books, I have a contract. I know it's going to get there, and I know I'm going to get yeah. remunerated. <clears throat> so then, again, it's just – and I think all artists who need to make a living in other areas need to find this balance. How do I make sure that I'm safeguarding and honoring the part of me that has no guarantee of ever being seen or heard, that has no immediate financial stake, and yet is the most precious thing that I have to offer. Yes, I think I think this is a beautiful way to say what all of us need to um, take care or preserve, because uh, with the need of bending in or finding that thing that sells, finding the income, finding the work, we're kind of doing this negotiation, eh? how much can I offer? How much can I be with this part, yeah. this self? Yeah. But I think it's the base of our, our well-being. No? This, this really enjoyment of life for being fresh with our own selves and finding the way how to express what we really have come from. Well, why we anyone, are here. And of course, and, and this is where it circles back to my father's work, because if you believe him, which on this I do, uh authenticity becomes the most important thing as we get older and attachment which means attachment to security to survival to other people even to our parents even to our friends even to our families it's important and we want to have both 
But if I had to choose being myself over pleasing others or fitting in with others, it'll be a lot healthier for me to choose being myself and lonely and sad rather than <laughs> surrounded by people and unfulfilled. Yes. And and for, for me as a creative artist, I simply can't do it because I get depressed immediately when I'm, when I'm not honoring my creative impulses yeah. and life isn't worth living. So that's, authenticity, that's, authenticity yeah. demands that I do that. So that, you know, this, again, the trick for me is, my dad has tapped into a whole lot of things that are true, but how do they apply to me? Because they may not, they don't apply to me in the same ways that they apply to him. I have to translate it for myself. And usually that means finding it somewhere else. It doesn't, I'm kind of inoculated against his, <laughs> like I can't do compassionate inquiry on myself. It just doesn't, I just see through it, you know? No, no, but that's okay. I think, I think uh, it wouldn't work for everyone. I mean, there are a bunch well, that's, of people that's, that's for true. him, that's it's true. not working at all because they are that's very true. different. So that's it's, that's true. It's it's good to have different paths. Absolutely, and not not to put all your eggs in one, yeah, one yeah. basket, and and not to turn anyone into a guru. Yeah, absolutely. That's super important. Even if your father could be, but there is also the person. You know? Well, you know, I guess I guess the meaning of the word guru in the original, you know, the the Indian tradition there are gurus who consciously take it on and it means something but it obliges them to something too there's it's a yeah. it's a big responsibility they knowingly do it and they're going to be teachers and have disciples and you know then if they if they mess that up there's huge consequences yeah right yeah. But, but that's a that's, different that's, relationship i think that's a different that's, relationship that's different than being a celebrity or yes. being being someone that people just project a lot of things onto and worship and revere yeah um, so that's yeah. the nature of, of turning ordinary people, turning teachers into gurus, turning experts into gurus, turning celebrities into gurus. Yeah, um, it's it's it's, the, it's difficult. Yeah, no, I'm difficult. sorry. So you, you you know the basic human need with uh, looking up to your parents and so on. If if it was not fulfilled or met, there will be always a gap. So we, oh, yeah. or maybe someone would always look forward or who I can put above me because I need to be in that relationship. So there's a lot of project thing well, that is going see, on all yeah, around see, our life we see that in politics yeah for half of the american population donald trump is the strong protective daddy they never had for yeah. the other half for the other half he's the mean cold abusive daddy exactly. and, Ob and obama is the warm uh affectionate smart charming good-looking daddy that they always want to do it maybe they idealized and they shove down their sadness about the other sides of him, so they choose not to see the other sides of him. And meanwhile, for the other half of America, Obama is a false, fake um, charlatan. And they're all correct. Like, everyone is seeing something, but they're looking at it. Just like when people look exactly. at our Hello Again videos, you look at some of the comments, and they say, Daniel is a spoiled brat who still hates his father. I can't <laughs> listen to him. He's too triggering. He, surely, he, he has nothing to teach me. He clearly hasn't worked out his stuff. Other people say, I, I turned this video off after Gabor said that to Daniel. I can't believe he's such a jerk. Yeah. I'm, never, I'm never reading anything by him again. Most other people are like, wow, you're both so adorable and fallible and human. And some people are like, geez, I don't want anything to do with either of you. Yeah. Yeah, we have so many options in this world, you know, like everybody yeah. literally can perceive the word as they want to. Well, unconsciously, but as they want to, because everything is true. There is not this truth of... We tend to perceive the world in ways that will confirm what we're committed to believing. Exactly. We are all deeply committed to certain beliefs. We're just not aware that we're committed to them. And we're always winning the game we're actually playing, not the win, not the game we say we're playing. So if I'm playing the game of I'm right and you're wrong, well, then I'll always find evidence for that. And I'll always win that game. What I won't win the game of is being close with you. Exactly. Exactly. So these these are really good things to to consider if we want to be well. I use the word well because because it it doesn't say that everything is good and shiny happy and and right. we are always on the bright side. There is winter, there is darkness, there is difficulties. There are a lot of things in life that can go hayway, and then we come back and we do our best. But in this balance of uh, good thing, bad thing, every color, every music. Sometimes you have to listen really bad music just to keep company for a person we love. Oh yeah. 
for sure. And we do that because we love the person. So there are a lot of things that we might not like, but we are well in the big picture. And wellness and healing and wholeness all have the same etymological root, I think. And ultimately, it's about being whole. Yeah. Being able, being able to hold the whole range of things. It's also about alignment. Alignment with what? Alignment with what makes us the best of who we are. Yeah, that's true. And I really like your the quote that you put in the Mental Killer Practice page. I think it says, when your mind aligns, you just work. I would yeah, say we- you just are you just be because when you're aligned it's very coherent so you will really do and feel what you think and be aligned with that yes and that's what i meant by you just work it but what i don't mean is you function you're a good machine but i mean is you're aligned you so you can just be which means that whatever you do will be coming with maximum efficiency and creativity and suppleness and and, yeah and, and all your good all your good qualities will be right there so you just get to be yourself and accomplish all the things yourself can accomplish when your mind is aligned with itself. When it's not, things move a lot slower and a lot more painful. Yeah, and, and a lot more sweaty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is not the best for creativity, to say so. No, I mean, they do say creativity is... 70% perspiration and 7, 30% inspiration, but that just means commitment. You know, that means, yeah. that means you got to show up and be willing to do it. It does take discipline, but yeah. again, if it's worth it to you and you can live true to that, there's rewards in that. Yeah. And this is what I wish everyone should discover in their own life. And I would like to thank you, Danielle, very deeply to you be here with us today and uh, I will add your details and YouTube so I hope people find you and yes, if you live in Philadelphia or in New York around please go and see the music when it yeah comes look me up. look me up uh and uh yeah absolutely I'd be happy to hear from people thank you <laughs>